Ta-da! Here they come. Oh boy. We have 37, 41, 43, 46. Everyone's coming into the call. Welcome, 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 everyone. You are in the right place. The Movement Voter Pack MVP sneak peek of MVP's early strategy for 2024. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We, we believe in getting started right on time and want to just thank the team, everyone who worked so hard to create all this, all the people working behind the scenes are all the different parts of the MVP team. We have over 600 people RSVP tonight. Um, and for early people, if there's anyone you know in your household or someone you want to text, this is going to be a real treat tonight. So just want to, we're all organizers here. Think about one person who might want to watch this with you and you can talk about it afterwards like a movie. All right. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Today's agenda. Um, we're, this is our first call, y'all, since 2022. Um, so we're going to do a quick report back and celebration. And then we're going to look ahead at 23, 24. And we have amazing guests, uh, Rima, our, our Wisconsin State Advisor, and Manka from Freedom Action Now are going to talk about the number one political opportunity in 2023 um, and report back from the election that happened yesterday in Wisconsin. Then we're going to hear a case study from, from not Wisconsin, across the lake, Michigan, um, from Jamila and Ken, who are going to talk about what does it look like when you win and you win a trifecta and then you get to govern. Um, and then we're going to close it out with our donor organizing team. And what can you do? What can we do? Um, and we're going to hear from our very special uh, super volunteer, uh, Sharon. So let's dive in. Okay. So 2022, remember that? So remember back in 2021, this is amazing when all the pundits were saying it's going to be a bloodbath, it's going to be a red wave. And in the deepest depth of that time, we said, we can't let that happen. We are going to fight. We're going to fight, 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 fight. We're going to defy the odds. And even when we said that, people were like, yeah, right. And what happened? Go back to that slide. We said it. We did it. They reported it. It's pretty great when the major news media uses your exact framework in defying the odds. And we did it. We have so much to celebrate. All of you were part of that. Everyone who contributed to defying the odds and believing in this seemingly impossible vision, we did it. And there was so much we did. I want to make a huge plug if you haven't yet read the annual report. It's the top thing on the website. It's really amazing to just read and savor. These are all competitive, competitive races that we invested in where we won. And, you know, a lot of them we won by large amounts. What's really interesting, what we really live for is the ones we won by teeny tiny narrow margins. And in the 11 election cycles I've been doing this, I have never seen so many races that we won by narrow, narrow margins. And the um, you're, you're about to see just a tiny uh, sliver of those races. There, there are 25, it was actually 35, but 25 groups of races that were won by super narrow margins. Look at this. Nebraska, we blocked the supermajority by 82 votes. Pennsylvania flipped the state house, 63 votes, right? So many incredible things. Minnesota, this, this trifecta that we just um, helped, that our groups won, they did this, a thousand votes. And then last night we get we get videos from the, the Minnesota state house of people celebrating because they just re-enfranchised 55,000 people who were on probation. They just allowed people to have driver's licenses and have dignity when they drive their, their kids to school or go to the grocery store and not have to worry. These are the, the why we do this work. And it's so incredible. And just want to take a moment to celebrate. And everyone, you can introduce yourself in the chat. What are you celebrating from last year? What are you thinking about? for 2024. I want to take this moment to celebrate. Um, 
I wish I could play the video that, that we just got of people celebrating saying si se puto in the in the state house hugging and crying and we're on zoom so we can't do that but but I just want people to feel the effect that all our work together has had all over the country and really encourage people to read that because now we're going to talk about some bad stuff um and we're going to go into yeah so lots to celebrate but also places where we fell short now the five closest house races all together were only 6,683 votes that we lost, right? And the closest Senate race in Wisconsin, 26,000 votes. Now look, if we had 7,000 more votes, we could have a Democrat trifecta right now. With 7,000 more votes. With 33,000 votes, we could have had a trifecta plus Mandela Barnes, which would have given us the 52 senators. Remember when we were like, ah, oh, mansion cinema, like if only we had 52 senators, we could pass all the things. We almost had that, y'all. We almost had that. We came so close and we, we overperformed. We did good with a little bit more. We could be in a whole different world right now. We could be in the progressive decade right now. So I want people to think about that when we think about the next election so we don't have any regrets after the next election and then there were flashing warning signs in places like florida and texas you know and and you know trump lowered the bar so much that that even a terrible governor like brian kemp looks reasonable and gets suburban voters and that is exactly what we're worried about in 2024 with desantis when when we'll go to next so basically zooming out thinking about the next decade, thinking about our strategy, not only for the next 19 months, because early voting starts in 19 months, but for the next decade. So these are images of, um, you can fill in your own images of utopia or dystopia. we basically have a very stark choice, a very stark choice for all of us who love our people, our communities, our country. In the next 10 years and in the next 19 months, we could find ourselves in a wonderful scenario or going on the path of a progressive country, or we could find ourselves spiraling in a mega autocratic direction. So very stark choices for all of us in our, our lives and our huge life decisions over the next 19 months. And you know, there's all this talk about Trump, Trump, Trump. I want to say a word about DeSantis because I think people are still fighting the last battle and people are like, who knows what's going to happen in this election? We have to be really clear. We don't know what's going to happen. And I, I would be happy to be wrong, but we have to prepare for the most likely scary scenario, which is DeSantis, probably with Nikki Haley or Tim Scott as a running mate, you know, Biden just won by 10,000, 20,000 votes in Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin. If DeSantis, and I, I chose this picture deliberately because we're not just running against him, we're running against his family that looks like the Kennedys, right? They can peel off, you know, a couple tens of thousands of suburban votes in Atlanta, Milwaukee, um, and Phoenix, you know, instead of winning by 10,000 votes, we're losing by 10,000 votes. And then we spiral into a very scary scenario, which is a, a really a DeSantis trifecta. Um, because if DeSantis wins or whoever the candidate is, wins the presidency, they almost certainly also win the Senate and the House, and they also have the Supreme Court. So take a moment to think about this, because we're in a like relatively halfway decent moment right now politically we're like whew, you know we're not in that trump era anymore people in 19 months well 19 months starts early voting 20 months from now we could find ourselves in a worse if it's if you can believe it worse situation than we were in under trump okay so i want people to really like process how bad the situation is if we don't do something very differently. And, and it gets worse. And I'm going to go a little bit in depth on the Senate because people don't understand, you know, like back in, in the old days, in, in 2008, there were 16 Democratic senators in red states, right? We had senators in Indiana and Nebraska. We had 
both senators in Arkansas. We had all four senators in the Dakotas. Like that world doesn't exist anymore. There are only three Democratic senators left in red states, which are all up in 2024. 2024 is like the worst perfect storm for Democrats in the Senate that's maybe ever happened. So we we, we got Manchin, um, uh, uh, Manchin in West Virginia, Sherrod Brown, Ohio, John Tester in um, in Montana. So those three are like super endangered, right? And you know, raise your hand if you can't stand Mansion. None of us can stand Mansion. This is not about Mansion. This is about saving the Senate and saving the Supreme Court, right? Um, Arizona. We just had this curveball with Cinema. So that's so those those four seats are super endangered. Then there's these other four. Re regular competitive states. So there's eight states that were defending the Senate and there's no pickup opportunities, no pickup opportunities, right? So we have to run the tables and win all eight of those seats. But then you say, okay, well, maybe if we lose the Senate, we'll get it back next time or then the time after that. So let's look at this. How many Republicans are there in, in blue states we can pick up? None, zero. How many Republicans are there in purple states we might be able to pick up? Over the next four cycles, there are four Republicans, okay? There's there's uh, Susan Collins in Maine, there's Ron in 2026, there's Ron Johnson in Michigan in 2028 again, and then both North Carolina seats. Hashtag North Carolina is super important for saving and keeping the Senate if we if we lose it. Right. So just want you to look at that Senate map. We're going to have to fight like hell for every single Senate seat, like it was a presidential, even if it's people we can't stand like uh, Manchin. OK, so this is um, I I'm telling you the bad stuff. We're, we're going to get to the good stuff. Don't worry. Um, but I'm going to go one more level of bad. So we have to hold the presidency for the next 10 or 15 years because of these Supreme Court justices. Clarence Thomas is 74. And if we even let them control the presidency and our Senate for any period of time, he can retire and be replaced by a 45 year old. And then we're not talking about 10 years to, to replace the Supreme Court. We're talking about 30 years. Okay. And this is what, what's, flips me out is I haven't heard anyone lay down this analysis and kind of put all these pieces together. So, um, okay. So that was the bad scenario. We're going to go on to the good scenario. Take a deep breath, shake out the bad scenario. It's really bad. Get a glass of water, breathe. Okay. There is a good scenario. We are going to fight with everything we've got for this good scenario, right? So the good scenario looks like this. We have a plan, we have a roadmap, and it's a, it's a 10 year plan. Basically, step one, we have to get through 2024. If we can get through 2024, if we lose in 2024, the rest of this plan goes away. Like we, we're in a pit, we have to start again. We have to somehow climb out of the pit. If we get through 2024, then there are a lot of potential good things that come after that. The good news is, let's pretend the two sides fight each other to a draw. Let's let's say we we get twice as good and twice as much money to do what we're doing. The other side gets twice as good and twice as much money. We have an advantage if we can hold it, which is young people, young people, young people, young people. Every two years, there are seven million new potential voters in the electorate, 18 and 19 year olds, seven million. And consistently, they have been voting at least 60-40 for Democrats in the last nine elections. If we can keep investing in them, young people, people of color, if we can keep investing in them, that's a 1.4 million new net Democratic votes nationally every two years, right? So in a state like North Carolina or Georgia, that's 50,000 new net Democratic voters every two years. So... Our job, if we can get through 2024, our job should get a little bit easier every two years because the electorate, if we can keep investing in them, is moving in our direction. And the next big thing I want you to notice, this big inflection point around 2030, 
is it's an opportunity for redistricting, right? So if we can, re, you know, if we can, with the census and the redistricting, if we can win the governorships of Texas, Georgia, the state Supreme Court in North Carolina, we can potentially redistrict fairer maps in those states after 2030. And in the 2032 election, we can win robust democratic majorities and the 2033 legislative cycle, 10 years from now, no coincidence, 10 years from now, we can have a robust progressive decade. So if you've heard us talk about the progressive decade and making the 2020s and progressive decade, we lost some of our chance to like really do that in 2022 by not winning all the stuff that we wanted to win. But we have another chance to do it. Basically, we should think of the next 10 years as a contested decade, which if we win the, the contested decade, then a robust progressive decade can truly begin. So that's, that's the 10 year plan, but wait, there's more. So this is the plan that we've been working up, but just in the last week, in the last few days, there's a potential amazing new scenario. And we just added the slide today um, and I'm still processing it. It's potential really, really incredible news, which is, you know, basically we've been like, the assumption has been like, it'll be really hard to hold the Senate, but there's polling out just in the last couple of days that shows Ruben Gallego, the, the Democratic candidate in Arizona, winning in both head-to-heads and three waves with cinema, which means if Ruben Gallego wins in, in Arizona, we replace cinema who wasn't voting for, you know, things like voting rights with Ruben Gallego. And then if we can do that, if we can hold the whole Senate, if we can win the presidency, the House, and hold the Senate, which are all doable, they're very doable, then in 2025, we can do a rerun of all the stuff we were trying to do in 2021, pass voting rights, pass stronger climate legislation, pass a care agenda, you know, all the things we really wanted that we were so frustrated we didn't get. And the voting rights legislation is especially amazing because it has fair redistricting in it for every state. So we wouldn't have to wait until the 2030s for a Texas or a Georgia, you know, or all these terribly gerrymandered states. And I, I'm honestly, I'm just wrapping my head around this. This is like breaking news <laughs> that we can potentially do this. So, so I just wanted to, to share this exciting news that we're still processing. Um, and yeah, so I hope that all makes sense. But basically the headline is we have to invest with everything we've got in 2023 to, to win in 2024, everything is on the line, um, both the, the, I call it the guillotine and the rainbow. We, we, went, we went rainbows, not guillotines in the, in the next uh, 20 months. Okay, so I'm gonna go really quickly through the, the political landscape. This is early um, look at the map. And this is overlaying all the, the different maps you're about to see, which we're gonna go through really fast. So it's the presidential, the Senate, the House, um, and we can just roll through these really fast. Um, the Senate map, the president, you've already seen, the House map, uh, the state level power, which includes governors, secretaries of state, state chambers. Um, so MVP is overlaying all of these maps. And we don't just, um, when we say states, uh, stick with this slide a second, we don't just mean, when we say Pennsylvania, we don't just mean, a lot of people are like, Pennsylvania, and they mean Philly and Pittsburgh, you know? We really care deeply about supporting groups to organize their whole states. But back to the, uh, the Pennsylvania slide is, I want people to see, so these dark blue counties were counties that we were invested in um, before 2022. And if you you notice those, those three light blue counties, that's uh, that's uh, Center County in the middle, Lackawanna and Luzerne, which, where, which is where State College, Scranton, and um, uh, what's the name of that town? It's on the tip of my tongue, um, are. So we supported groups to expand into these counties. So it, 
you know, it's not just an urban strategy. It's a, it's a whole um, statewide strategy. Okay, let's go on to the next uh, slide. Because basically what we're trying to do, and, and part of what's really special about Move and Voter Project and what you're going to hear in, in, in depth is that we don't just fund a good organization or a campaign and then leave. We are, are here for the long term, supporting ecosystems of groups to work collaboratively to transform their states. And our state advisors, who you'll hear, have these conversations with groups and groups of groups how are you going to transform Georgia over the next five or 10 years? And how do we partner with you in doing that? So it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, first, we're going to hear from Rima and then Manka in Wisconsin, who just had a huge election last night. Um, and Rima has just been doing incredible work supporting over 40 groups. Oh, I won't. Um, I'll let Rima talk about it. Rima, are you there? I'm here. Hello, everyone. Um, as Billy said, my name is Rima Ahmed, and I am indeed our resident Wisconsin expert and a lifelong Midwesterner. And I'm excited to share more about my state because, um, among other things, because I'm out here, I know a lot about what is at stake in 2023 to ensure that we can win in 2024. And I know Billy just said a lot about, you know, what we're going to be doing over the next 10 years, a progressive decade. But what if I said that there's actions that we can take today, this, this year, this month, this spring, to ensure that we have a progressive pathway and that it is as clear as possible for us in 2024? What if I said that we could keep the momentum going from defying the odds in 2022 and going so that we can secure those critical wins for our entire progressive ecosystem? Well, I'm really proud to say that the Wisconsin Supreme Court race this spring is just that. This race is our once in this decade chance to secure repro rights for Wisconsinites, finally have fair maps and protect, protect democracy and voter access for all. But before I get into the specifics of this race and the grassroots groups that are going to lead us to a win this spring, I wanna take a step back and remind everyone about Wisconsin's recent past because the Wisconsin of today has been over 10 years in the making. Folks, remember the 2010 Tea Party takeover um, in Wisconsin that brought in a Republican trifecta with Scott Walker at the top. And over his 10 years in office, Walker decimated progressive infrastructure. Luckily, uh, since 2016, MVP has been deeply investing in Wisconsin. And slowly, sometimes it feels painfully slow, we have been reconnecting and refreshing our progressive roots. And what have we done in that time? Well, in 2018, we got rid of Scott Walker. In 2020, we elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and just a few months ago, we protected the governor's veto, not to mention getting as close as we have ever gotten to defeating Ron Johnson. We did that. So we are coming back from the precipice out here, and if we're going to stand a chance at bringing Wisconsin's progressive, his progressive history and legacy back, it is going to take dedicated investments and a disciplined staying the course. So you have here on the screen some statistics, because honestly, the margins are still razor thin in Wisconsin. If you look at some of these, um, yes, we had a Wisconsin version of a landslide in Governor Tony Evers' 3% victory last November. And Mandela, Mandela lost by one, only 1%. Again, getting closer than even our progressive champion, Russ Feingold, got. Uh, looking a little further back to 2019, which is the last time we had a Supreme Court race uh, during a quote unquote off year. Although if you know Wisconsin, you know, we have elections every year. There's no such thing as an off year out here. Um, but back in 2019, the Republican candidate won by less than 6,000 votes. So again, um, the races are still really close. We have a lot at stake. Um, so let's get into some of the specifics for the race this year. Well, we had a primary yesterday. Um, and folks may know, um, yep, primary, it was really exciting. Um, we had four candidates on the ballot. Um, this is a nonpartisan race. So, um, you know, the candidates were just running as themselves. So we do know the political ideology of, of these candidates. And um, we have two candidates now. We have a liberal candidate, Judge Janet Protasiewicz, and a conservative candidate, uh, Daniel Kelly. And I just have to uplift, you know, yesterday, it was a sunny, cold day. 
And while we still don't have all the data in yet, we already know that turnout was high. It was high for a primary, um, especially again, during an off year um, in the winter time, which means that progressives and conservatives alike are engaged and mobilized in this race. Um, and just another anecdote I want to uplift from yesterday, because um, I don't want to steal any of Monka's thunder. I know she's going to be sharing um, a lot about the work that they're doing. Um, but the youth turned out yesterday. Um, there are so many examples all across the state, but I'll just uplift one um, at a polling site at UW-Madison. Poll workers were expecting only 27 students to come out and vote, and they had nearly 500 students turn out. They literally ran out of paper ballots, and students had to wait in line to use the one voting machine to be able to cast their ballots. So we know that our base is energized, um, and that's good because if we look at a timeline here, um, we've got an election in six weeks, y'all. <laughs> And it's a, it's a bit surreal because honestly, for so many of the groups on the ground, they've been preparing for this race since at least last summer. And so with just six weeks away until um, the April 4th election, there's a lot at stake uh, to protect democracy and to set ourselves up for a win in 2024. But no pressure, right? And speaking of what's at stake, Many of the progressive issues that we all care about, um, I'm talking about repercussions not only for Wisconsin, but our entire Midwest region, for the country. We're talking about the opportunity to repeal the 170-year-old abortion ban in Wisconsin. If we flip the court, we have a chance to revisit our notoriously gerrymandered maps, some of the most gerrymandered in the nation, and maps that are going to be in effect for the next decade. Not to mention, importantly, expanding voter access and protecting democracy, up to and including ensuring we certify the presidency in 2024. And let me say that again, because I believe that repetition is holy. This election will shape the outcome of the 2024 presidential race, as well as every presidential race to come. So again, we know this is a critical election. We know what is at, what it is at stake. But how are we gonna win this? And we're gonna be hearing from one of our incredible grassroots partners again in a bit, uh, so stay tuned. But generally what we're talking about here is leaning into some of Wisconsin's superpowers. I'm talking about bold and innovative organizing like deep canvassing and mutual aid work. We're learning lessons, um, especially from the last few years around messaging and comms. And we're putting strategies like race class narrative together that inoculates voters against racist dog whistles that would otherwise divide voters in our state. We are unapologetically trusting the grassroots in the state to build together. And so a little bit more on, on how MVP is showing up in this. Um, as Billy started to say, um, we support more than 40 partners in over half of Wisconsin's 72 territories. 72 counties. We work closely with the tables to share strategy, identify gaps, and show up for groups leading on the groundwork. And importantly, we are seeding groups that eventually make it to the tables. I'm talking about organizations like Grassroots Organizing Western Wisconsin, Action, and Blue Sky Waukesha. These are organizations that don't receive much, if any, support from national funders and who rely on MVP for grants and amplification. So before I turn it over to my fellow Wisconsinite, I wanna say this one more time. Wisconsin is clawing its way back from the precipice. Elections out here are won and lost by extremely small margins, but I know we can win this. We helped Wisconsin out Scott Walker, we defeated Donald Trump, and we prevented a Republican trifecta in the state. We can keep Wisconsin from falling back into long lasting conservative agendas. We've done it before and we will do it again. So with that, I want to introduce an incredible leader in Wisconsin. Um, and I have to say, I first met Monka in 2018. And I don't know, Monka, if you remember this, but we were in that progressive leadership development program together. And it's just so incredible to see that since then, she has helped build a political home for Black and AAPI voters across Wisconsin at Freedom Action Now. So it is an honor to be in this work with you, Monka. And I'm going to turn it over to you to share more about the power building plans you all have for this year. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rima, for that amazing intro. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you so much, MVP, for uh, inviting me out here. And thank you so much for your support of our work. Um, even though we're a new organization, um, you all have been really strong, funny partners 
and just lifting up our work in wherever spaces you're in. So I really appreciate that. Um, and you know, I'm so excited. All the framing um, that I just listened to, um, you, you know, it's good to continually hear it. And like you said, repetition is holy. So like really internalizing it as well. Like, yes, we will win, um, you know, and I, I truly believe that. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm here to speak a little bit about um, our spring 2023 plans, um, specifically surrounding the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Um, so a little bit more about myself and my organization. My name is Monka Donway. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I'm here representing Freedom Action Now. Um, you'll hear me also refer to us as FAN. Um, we are located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we are a Black and Southeast Asian-led organization um, that is really fighting to make sure that um, specifically survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault get justice um, and are able to participate um, in the electoral process and, and build political power. Um, and so that's a little bit about us. What I really wanna focus on when it comes to the 2023 um, spring elections um, is you know our focus on Southeast Asian and Black voters. Um, so that is definitely um, a strategic um, intervention on our parts. Um, we definitely educate and, and work to um, turn out and call and, and door knock um, all Wisconsin voters, but we are um, keying in on and have specific strategies around Southeast Asian and Black voters. And here's why. Um, you know, Wisconsin is a purple state and it's all about um, connecting with um, with everyone, but also folks who are in the margins and can actually win those elections for us. Um, one key highlight or things to know about the Southeast Asian community um, in Wisconsin is that, you know, it's one of the largest API populations in the state um, and mostly centering in Dane County and, and Milwaukee County. Um, and so, oh, sorry, can you go back to the last slide? Yeah, so <laughs> this is all about API voters in Wisconsin. Um, and just some key facts that I think that you all be really interested to know um, is that, you know, the largest ethnic groups um, among API groups in Wisconsin, again, are Southeast Asian. Um, and those are people who are in our base. Um, and then also um, the API population of el eligible voters grew by 64% between 2010 and 2020, um, which compared to 6% change for the rest of the state. Um, and so we definitely have a huge opportunity to get new voters um, and to bring in new progressive voters into the electorate um, through if we have really great um, you know, strategies focused on those communities. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, another community we focus on is Black voters. Um, in 2022, um, Black folks accounted for 6.8% of Wisconsin's population, and Milwaukee and Madison are home to the largest Black communities in the state. This is significant because um, we saw the, we're seeing the downturn or the decrease in Black voters um, turning out. Um, and it's important to know that Black voters are facing a lot of challenges and barriers when it comes to voting in Wisconsin. Uh, this quote that I have up here um, is from one of our um, supposedly like nonpartisan um, election commissioners, um, Robert Spendo from December of 2022, referencing um, the decrease in voter turnout in Milwaukee County and bragging about it. And so there's a lot um, that we're fighting against. Um, and you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of different strategies, but the main one within Black communities is that narrative building and our ability to get on the doors and on the phones and run ads and send mailers and things is the biggest uh, force to combat um, all of these um, voter suppression tactics, right? Um, and so that's definitely a huge part of our strategy around winning the state. Um, and, you know, it's really important to know, like, that this is what we're facing. And so if we want black turnout to come back up, 
um, we're going to have to invest like we want to win and we want Black turnout to come back up because it, it takes a lot of work. Um, and like I said, folks are facing really, uh, really like huge challenges and barriers to voting and voter suppression in, um, in Milwaukee, especially. So what is our spring election plan looking like? Um, we are really um, interested in, like Rima was saying, um, having bold, um, innovative strategies and tactics um, and scaling up around those. Um, you know, a lot of our work that we're going to be doing or that we even that we have been doing for the primary, that's what we're going to have in 2024. Um, contrary to like previous years or a typical year in Wisconsin, don't have any more elections before 2024. So whatever we build now is what we're going to have for 24. Like we can't just show up in February of next year with like the whole like vote or die messaging, right? Like it has to be like connecting and throwing down in this race in a really big way um, and making the connections for voters that, you know, this is what we actually have to gain through voting. Um, and, and what better race to do that with than one that has such huge implications for reproductive rights um, in Wisconsin. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely something that we're looking to um, build on from last year um, and really continue growing, like, especially um, in our state that is so, again, like narrative building is so important, um, making sure that we're actually getting out there to um, counties where Southeast Asian population is really strong um, and where the vote margin might be 2,000 votes, right? Um, and those votes add up, um, and it's really important um, that we start building the infrastructure that we're going to need in 24. Um, and so, yeah, that's mainly um, what our field work and on the ground work is going to look like for the rest of the campaign here. Um, and here's just some of our information for you all to keep in touch with us. Um, you know, we always are putting out things on our social media, voter education updates about um, the work that we're doing and everything. So please, please keep in touch with us. Um, like Rima said, like this is a super important election, not only because of the, you know, intervention opportunity for um, abortion rights and reproductive rights, but also uh, just because you know, we're building towards 2024 um, and our people need to see us and hear from us, um, especially when it comes to turning out um, in elections and making those connections for our folks. Um, and with that, I will say thank you and turn it back over to Rima. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to, um, um, I think it's me, Rima, right? So just want to say huge thank you to Rima and Manka um, and like the the work you all do is extraordinary and um and just want to brag about like one of one other thing which is um freedom freedom action now also anchors and supports local api groups all over wisconsin i think eight of them yeah and um that and rima sent us this picture of a local group that was um was giving people rice during the they had like a food bank giving people rice and registering them to vote like really brilliant like deep deep organizing work um along with with just the regular voter turnout work and if they if they win this you know and wisconsin has fair maps that could mean one or two new congressional seats that um that could be competitive and it could mean Democrats have a chance to actually win chambers and and have a trifecta like Minnesota. So this is huge, huge. I can't even stress how huge it is. So thank you everyone who's donating. Um, like they said, we have six weeks and um, and the money needs to get there now so people can make plans around that. Um, so next we're going to talk about what it looks like when you win. Um, and, and I'm going to introduce Jamila and there's just so many opportunities this year, you know, like in, in Pennsylvania, um, and all over the country, there are elections happening this year under the radar that will determine who administers uh, elections in places like Philly and Pittsburgh and 
all these these counties that it's so important to to win but we're gonna have a little celebration with michigan right now um and i'm gonna pass it to jamila to talk who's been working so hard with all these organizations uh to transform their state and and you got a pretty surprising result last uh fall huh very surprised. Well, I was surprised. I think I think we were all surprised. We'll see. Ken may, maybe Ken knew. Um, so yes, very exciting results in Michigan. First trifecta in 40 years. I um this is like too much detail, but I will say the last trifecta was only one year. So I really think it's the first trifecta ever because it like you have to go back, I can't remember, to like the 1800s or something. Like it doesn't exist. Um, so we won a uh, governor's seat. Secretary of State, Attorney General. Um, we took both the House and uh, State Senate, and we won two really important uh, ballot measures protecting voting rights. They're both constitutional ballot measures protecting voting rights and reproductive rights. Um, and we maintained our state Supreme Court majority. So it was a um, very big, very big election for us. Super exciting. Um, what I want to talk about today and what Ken is going to highlight um, later is what we do with that so that um, we win in 2024. Um, and so, you know, victory in 2024 requires a number of things from our partners. There are about 30 to 40 partners, depending on the year here in Michigan. Um, and so there's a lot that they're actually doing now. I know people think sometimes like, oh, this is an off year from an election standpoint. Um, but there's a ton of election related, like there's a ton of work that's happening right now that is setting us up um, to win in 2024. And I will say in 2024, I think you saw on Billy's map earlier, we will have an open Senate seat. So Debbie Stabenow has announced her retirement and that will be um, really critical for us uh, in addition to the presidential, of course. Um, and so there are three core focuses for groups right now um, in order to win in 2024, winning a legislative agenda that directly improves people's lives, um, ballot initiative and candidate preparation, candidate preparation, um, and then improving their capacity and infrastructure. So I'll talk super briefly about these and then Ken will really drive it home for like, what is it, what does it actually look like for an organization? Um, so, you know, for 40 years, Democrats really for longer have told voters that the reason that none of the things that we want um, are possible is because Republicans are in charge. And that is just not an excuse anymore. And we saw for the first time the difference, the really clear difference um, between having a Republican run legislature and a Democrat one um, after the MSU mass shooting last week, which you probably heard of three students were murdered, um, five folks were, were injured. There was a mass shooting a few years ago at a high school um, north of Detroit um, where four people were killed and absolutely nothing happened. Um, this year, uh, this week, Democrats have already introduced 11 bills um, for safe storage, um, extreme risk protection orders, and universal background checks. And we fully expect that those will move through the House and the Senate quickly and go to the governor's desk um, and be signed. So there is a, a clear and obvious difference um, that elections had and will have on people's lives. Um, that's not the only thing that they are moving forward. They are also um, in the process of already moving forward anti-discrimination legislation, uh, protecting LGBTQ folks. Um, they appropriated the first state funding for water prevention, water shutoff prevention, which has been a huge issue um, around the state, in particular in Detroit, but in other um, urban centers as well. And there is a massive list of policies that we have been like sitting on for 40 years that we um, are hopeful that they will drive through. Again, like that is going to take organizing, you know, not like just because we have a trifecta does not mean that everything just sails through. Billy talked earlier about like mansion and cinema. I think we all know everybody's got their mansions, everybody's got their cinemas. And so there is there's a lot of work to do. Um, for groups to advocate and hold electeds accountable. Um, and, you know, if we take our foot off the gas, if we like make the mistake of not passing a bold agenda, thinking that, that, that we were elected for some kind of a moderate kind of mealy nothingness, um, it will be very hard to motivate people in 2024 to keep electing Democrats. 
So the second focus um, that groups are preparing right now um, or are doing is, is preparing what's gonna be on the ballot. And that's both the proposals, which have been really critical and the candidates. So in the past three cycles, ballot proposals um, in Michigan have been a really important part of democratic victories, um, including successful initiatives to end gerrymandering. So we do, we uh, were able to pass fair uh, nonpartisan redistricting in Michigan in 2018. Um, to expand voting rights. That's how we got uh, no reason absentee and 40 days of early voting, like a bunch of stuff that we've now then been using to our advantage over the past couple of cycles. Um, and also most recently uh, protecting abortion. So these are pretty massive undertakings. They end up, you know, costing like 20 to $30 million. You have to collect like six or seven or 800,000 signatures. It's a very big deal. And so right now, um, groups that are thinking about that are like are doing a bunch of different kinds of testing. They're doing legal drafting. They're doing more testing. They're building coalitions, fundraising. You know, honestly, trying to figure out which one makes sense because there's only so many that can kind of go. So there's quite a bit of work um, now that groups are engaging in around that. And then the other thing they're doing is uh, participating in statewide candidate recruit recruitment and uh, training. And so some groups do that through a centralized um, apparatus. Some of them have that on their own. Ken's gonna talk about um, what that looks like for Michigan People's Campaign later. And then the last thing, um, you know, in order to win, we have to get a lot more sophisticated about our backend operations. Um, too many of our partners are just spending too much time worrying about administrative issues, which is like not what you think of when you think of organizing, but that's actually what a lot of directors and staff spend their time dealing with because they're like employers and they're legal entities and they're all this stuff. And so um, because of that, MVP has been supporting a founding group of our partners to launch an operations hub. Um, and we really believe, I believe, we the royal we, <laughs> that you know, once this additional capacity is fully online, it's going to dramatically expand the ability of groups to do more aggressive political work, um, not just kind of the voter registration and general education, but really getting out there and being hard hitting about um, turning out folks, um, you know, for particular candidates and particular issues. So that's the general of like of what groups are doing right now that's setting us up for 2024. I'm going to pass it over to Ken Winokur, who leads Michigan People's Campaign next to talk about what it means from the perspective of, of an organization. Let me just say a little bit about Michigan People's Campaign. Um, they are really the, the kind of core, like statewide, multi-issue, multi-constituency, multi-racial organization in Michigan. So they are the, kind of the longest standing of our partners. They're the largest program of our partners. They are, they were, you know, using more sophisticated and more, more kind of complex political um, strategies than anybody else first. And a lot of us like have looked to them for many years for like how we should be developing our organizations over time. Um, and Ken himself has a, a long background both in community organizing and um, in electoral politics. He knows he comes from the party, he knows some party stuff. And a little shout out um, is that his wife actually helped lead the um, successful uh, reproductive rights ballot initiative last year. So it's a it's like a storied political family. Um, and that's it, so I'm gonna pass it over to Ken. Thank you, Jamila, thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Whitaker. I'm the executive director of Michigan People's Campaign. We're a statewide organization that's developing a multiracial democracy that truly represents the residents of Michigan and building a base of people that are always ready to take action at any given moment on the issues that are directly impacting their lives. You know. Billy and Jamila said it in 2023, we have the power to push through a, a transformative agenda, but we owe that to having a democratic trifecta in the state for the first time in 40 years, whereas, as Jamila said, the first time ever, really, because the last one was just one year. But let's be real. It was the issues that brought people out to vote in droves, not the candidates. People saw their lives reflected on the ballot and they were compelled to vote. We politicize people on issues like reproductive freedom for all, the campaign that my wife ran, term limit reform, that was another ballot initiative, including expanding access to the ballot. But by leading, leading with ballot proposals, training and equipping our Canvas teams with the resources and support they needed, 
In strategically targeting our geographic and demographic universes, we made the difference in key races and flipped districts. Our Canvas team wasn't just large, it was highly impactful. For comparison, the Michigan Democratic Party canvassed 290,000 voters, but with a staff of 122 people and a $14 million budget. We canvassed a little more than 208,000 voters, but with less than half of the staff and a fraction of the budget. That is the power of grassroots organizing and leadership development. We've launched a permanent issue-based canvas. We're going to build our base, develop leaders and leadership and connect voters, connect with voters right now. The issues voters care about, they don't disappear in December and neither, neither should we. Now is the time to capitalize on all of our wins. So we're launching an organizing revival this year to connect with voters where they are on the issues that they care about year round, not just during elections and working to push an aggressive legislative agenda with implications for 2024 and beyond. You know, speaking of developing leaders and leadership, our Movement Politics Academy has trained dozens of people to run for office or run campaigns. State Representative Lori Pahutsky, State Representative Abraham Ayash are just two of them. These are organizers at heart. And now they're organizing in the state legislature. They're organizing legislators around the issues that they ran on, around the issues that they learned to build movements on because they made their campaigns about the issues and building a movement instead of about themselves. And now with the Democratic majority, Lori Pahutsky is the speaker pro tem and Abraham Ayash is the majority floor leader. That's what building power looks like. This needs to be repeated over and over again in every state in this country if we're going to win on our issues. Now, we've built a 2023 legislative priority list around the issues that are greatly affecting the citizens of Michigan. And we didn't choose them. The citizens did. Workers' rights, immigrant rights, environmental justice, and gun violence. You just heard about the shooting at Michigan State University. Well, we've been working for a year and a half to put together a ballot proposal for universal background checks, safe storage, and extreme risk protection orders. But because of this democratic trifecta, now we're able to pivot to a legislative campaign. We've just told Democrats in our lobby meetings that we've said for years that this was a Republican problem. Well, if things don't get passed right now, it becomes a Democrat problem, and we have the base to hold them accountable to do it. This could have been prevented what happened at Michigan State with an extreme risk protection order. There were signs, there were flags, but there was no process to wave that flag. Education, elections, infrastructure, and civil rights, the criminal legal system, it rounds out our list of legislative opportunities. And we call them opportunities, not just priorities, because this is an opportunity for people to get the wins that really improve their lives. We politicize people on these issues, and this is how we keep them engaged year round. But even with the trifecta, it's a hard fight ahead. And Billy put in the chat that we really got to move Governor Whitmer and the, and, and the legislators, and he's right, because people have aspirations for the next office and the next office. So we need legislators to know that we have the will and the power to hold them accountable. And there are several benchmarks that we need to organize around leading into 24. Debbie Stabenow is retiring. Jamila said that. And we need to make sure that the person that fills her seat is a champion on all of our issues. There's only 100 senators in this country. And we need to make sure that the two coming from Michigan are voting the way they need to vote for the residents of this state. This is a purple state. We might have a trifecta. We might have gone for Biden. But this is a purple state at heart not because it's a mix of blue and red, it's purple because we've been beat black and blue. Two of our democratic representatives in the state house are running for mayor. So we're gonna be losing our democratic majority for a few months until we throw down in special elections to get it back. So we have got to hold our corporate Dems accountable and hold the line. We also need to organize for the 2024 primaries, especially now that Michigan is fifth in line. The 2024 primary will be a trial run to get ready for the 2028 open primary. God forbid we don't have an open primary, 
uh, well, God willing, we don't have an open primary in 24, but who knows? Um, but we're going to use what we learn to flex and test our power to defend this democratic trifecta, bolster our congressional delegation, and keep Michigan blue. This is a historic moment for Michigan. And with your continued support, we can turn Michigan into a national model for successful progressive organizing that delivers win after win after win. And we know that when we organize around the issues and build strong connections in our communities year round, we win and we win big. We've proven it. It is crucial that we invest in our people to do this work, not just in the months before election day, but each and every day. Thank you for having me today. Ken, thank you. Everyone give it up. I know, no, we can't hear each other, but give it up for Ken and Monica. We're gonna go over a couple minutes. I'm gonna introduce our um, donor organizing uh, team, director of donor organizing, Zoe Toby, who's gonna introduce our last special guest, Sharon Grinker, who is an incredible organizer. And just, yeah, give it up again for, um, for Ken and Monica and the incredible sophistication and scale they're bringing to saving their states, communities, and all of us. Um, Zoe, passing it to you to talk about what can we do now, Zoe? What can we do? Yes, what can we do now? Wow, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Rima. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, I'm going to be very brief and turn it over to uh, our super volunteer donor organizer in Wisconsin, Sharon Brinker. Um, I just want to say, you know, if you if you listen to what Billy said at the beginning, that we we actually have an incredible opportunity in the next year and two and two years to set the whole course for our political trajectory for the next 10 years. So um, I'm uh, reminded of this quote, if you want to, if you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done. So I just want to invite everybody on this call, everybody watching to consider what is it you're willing to do, including things maybe you've never done to be involved, to give your time, your talent, your energy. And if the MVP model resonates with, uh, with you, please join us. So go sign up to get involved with MVP. We're going to make it super easy for you to spread the word about MVP and the groups that we uh, partner with on the ground. Um, we're going to be uh, getting every all the supplies ready for you to have virtual house parties in the next few months uh, and just all kinds of great tools so that you can be not just giving your money, but also uh, bringing people you love, people you care about into this work and making a meaningful difference. And uh, as you heard from, from Rima, uh, <laughs> this election in Wisconsin is, you know, it is the beginning of uh, of it all. It is our best opportunity this year to make a real difference. So if you haven't yet, go to the link that we'll share in the chat and donate and uh, pass on our fundraising page to everyone you know. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon, uh, our, our volunteer on the ground in Wisconsin. Sharon, how's it feel and what do you want to say? Hi everyone, I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it feels very real. <laughs> it's real that abortion is illegal in my state, and I have a 21-year-old daughter, and the opportunity for making change right now is also very real. It feels within grasp. Um, this election, we believe, will be transformative for our state with all the possibilities that we will have if we can seat a progressive state Supreme Court justice. So the results are very encouraging from yesterday. I saw in the chat somewhere the little breakdowns on the primary results. Um, so we feel like we can do this. We're going to do this. Um, we have to work for it, not counting any chickens <laughs> before they're hatched, but um, it's all about turnout. MVP does turnout. They're working all across the state um, I like talking about the blue pockets and the areas that are tinging purple. So please join me um, in supporting uh, MVP partners in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm doing all I can to support MVP's work all across the state, and I hope you'll join me. Yeah, and Sharon has Sharon has been an incredible super volunteer. Sharon, can you just talk about how did you get involved? with MVP in the first place, you know, you were, you were someone who was like on one of these calls and how'd you become a super volunteer 
you know, um, off by yourself in Milwaukee. You, you weren't in Western <laughs> Mass or or Seattle where we have local teams. How, how did this happen? And and tell us about what it's like to be an MVP super volunteer. We didn't script this, by the way. Right. <laughs> I'm just putting share. Yeah. Um, I actually love telling the story, and I don't really know all of it. Um, that uh somebody reached a, a friend of my brother's from college reached out to him for my contact information because I think she just heard that. Um, his sister lived in Wisconsin and I think they were looking for someone who lived in Wisconsin Then she reached out. And so um, I had the opportunity to meet Rima and hear about the work. And I fell in love with the approach right away. The fact that Rima was reaching out to organizations all across the state and um, you know, the investment in long-term power building and trusted messengers, I just kind of dove in. Cool. Yeah. And, and what are some of the things you've done? And, and just for anyone out there, like, you know, I hope you're like seeing yourself in Sharon. You can be the next Sharon in where you live. You know, <laughs> what, what, what um, is like yeah. well, I started in 2020. I was organizing my first, you know, house party, which immediately was canceled before it happened because of COVID. But we started doing virtual house parties all summer and they just kind of snowballed. And we ended up raising, I think, over $100,000 for MVP partners in Wisconsin. It was amazing. Just the news just spread and one led to another. That's how it went. Yeah. That's what we did. <laughs> That's cool. So part of our dream is to, and why we have a donor organizing team, is to encourage, we want more people to see themselves in Sharon and be like, oh yeah, I could totally do that. You know, and, and it's step-by-step step. the our amazing donor organizing team holds people's hands through the process, you know? And if, if you're like, yeah, so just our dream is to have local teams everywhere, you know? So people who want to get involved, they're like, oh, I can be part of this awesome local team. We're going to have a house party and, and my support can go to supporting amazing groups like Freedom Action Now in my state or like a group like Michigan People's Campaign in another state. And so this this is the this is how we have to build this movement. And we we just want to invite everyone to be part of it in whatever way makes sense to you. So I, I want everyone to just take a moment and think about the next 19 months between now and when the start of early voting and think about your life and your priorities and your legacy and What's the biggest, I do this work because this is the biggest difference that I feel like I can make. That That's why all of us who, who do this do it. Um, and think about what's what's the biggest difference you can make. I love your quote, Zoe. Like, what, what, was, what was it again? If you want to see something you haven't seen, you have to do something you've never done. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's and Zoe or Sharon, do you do you want to just close us with any thoughts about organizing and how people can get involved or any? I guess people just sign up, right? Where do people sign up? Yeah, that's it. the The very next small step you can take is just click this <laughs> link, movement.vote slash sign up, and uh, and we'll you know we'll get in touch from there. Um, but w w this year is really going to be exciting. And whether you have a little bit of time or you, you know, you want to drop everything you're doing and, uh, you know, give all, all the time that you have to MVP, uh, we've, we've got the ways for you to be involved. There are so many people who've re retired who are like, okay, this is going to be my new second job, you know, and we, we welcome that. Like, like boomers, we are, we, we are, we want to work with you on your next second job, you know, and people who are thinking, about moving large amounts of money, it, you know, the our, our donor advising team is here to support you. We really want to encourage people. We skipped past a slide that um, where we break down our recommended timeline for giving in a in a two year cycle. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah. So we recommend. We actually recommend front loading it now because you got you know most donors who aren't savvy they're going to give at the end right? So a lot of money tends to come at the end. Well, the reason for giving now, and we, so anyone who's planning to give this year or this cycle, 
our biggest recommendation is front load it in the first quarter, front load it now. And that does a couple of things. One is it gets out to groups now so they can start making strict plans and more ambitious plans than they could have made before, you know, without the money now. And it also frees up our team's time. So we're not chasing you like, hey, can you please donate? No, you already donated. Now you can talk to other people to tell them to donate. And we can talk to other people who haven't donated yet. So it, it's actually really helps the process um, if you donate early and um, and if you let us know if you want to be involved in in some way, and we we try to make it fun. We try to because you know we're, we're we're trying to make this vision happen of having this progressive decade start in 2025, and having it start now in Michigan and and Pennsylvania. Sorry, Michigan and uh, Minnesota, and hopefully in Wisconsin shortly after that. And we just want to invite everyone to think about your next years and think about Movement Voter Project and all our partners and invite you to join us. You don't just have to be a spectator. We want you to be see yourself in the movie in whatever way you can. And it can be a little thing. It can just be as simple as forwarding an email for I'm co-hosting an event. You should check it out. And, and we're actually going to teach people to give a version of this PowerPoint presentation, this inspiring PowerPoint presentation. We are, we are creating it. And you can either, um, we can teach you to do it yourself, or you can have speakers come in, um, like people from our team and our, our super volunteers, like Sharon Grinker has actually learned to do it and help other states, et cetera. So I'm going to stop there. Big shout out to everyone on the MVP team, volunteers and staff, and all of our incredible partners and allies. We are in this together. We are going to create this vision that we deserve for this country that we dream of and that our children need so much. The icebergs are melting now. We cannot wait 10 years. We have to do this now. This is our legacy the big decisions we need to make in our lives, we need to make them now because we don't want to be in the other world in 2025 trying to climb out of a pit. So go team. We're going to win all these elections, probably by really narrow margins. And then we're going to look back and be so proud that we actually played a role in winning those elections by those narrow margins. And with that, I will say good night and welcome to the progressive decade we are going to build together, together with you and with all of us. Um, thank you, Manka. Thank you, Rima. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Zoe. And thank you, everyone who worked behind the scenes and who's working so hard in so many states all across the country to, to change the country into the country that we needed to be and to avoid really bad things that we don't even need to think about. So. Let's let's make the good ones happen so we don't have to. <laughs> the, the, my joke earlier today was rainbows, not guillotines. Actually, my colleague Rachel made that up. Rainbows, not guillotines. And I was like, go team, not guillotines. <laughs> so go team, not guillotines. And with that, I will say good night and let's go win. Let's make this happen. Let's build this progressive decade for all of us and everyone we love. Go team.